Good morning. Good to see everyone here today. I want to start things off by asking a question. <clears throat> and I've gotten very similar responses in the first and second services. But here's the question. Have you ever stepped on a nail before? If so, show me your hand. Okay. Yep, yeah, it's it's the same every service. I, I don't know, yeah, I don't take the time to count, but it looks like 65 to 75% of us raise our hand uh, to that question, and myself included. It was quite a few years ago that I remember, at least, uh, I've, I've stepped on thorns and stuff like that, too, while out hunting, and but uh, but I remember... Years ago, when I was serving in a church in Illinois, um, initially, the first several years, half of my responsibility there was being a youth pastor. And uh, so um, this one particular time, I got the whole youth group together, and we went, as I recall, I think, not that it matters, it was a Wednesday night, we went to uh, a town nearby uh, called Dallas City. And they had an old theater in this town that had been boarded up, shut down for many, many years. Uh, but the word was that uh, they were going to be uh, um, cleaning it out and doing something different there on that spot. And somehow the word had gotten to me and to some of us folks at the church and that uh, uh, all the old theater stuff was still there um, from way back when. And if we had any use for it, great. Otherwise, it was going to be hauled to a dump. And so I scouted it out and discovered that the old theater seats, which back in the day, the old theater seats didn't have any cushions on them. They were all wooden, but uh, um, about 50% of them were actually in good, fairly good condition. And so I talked to our church camp manager because we were in dire need of some better seating out at church camp and told him, hey, we can set you up here with quite a few. Um, theater-type seats, old-fashioned theater-type seats. And, and so anyway, I took the youth group, and we went there on a Wednesday night with this project in mind to load up several trucks and a couple of trailers, you know, with all these chairs. Now, I had made the mistake of doing this work with tennis shoes on. And so I was about halfway through the project, and sure enough, I stepped on a nail and I don't remember the, an issue with their, the nail having come out the top side of my foot, but it got really close. I mean, it, it went deep into my foot and uh, obviously hurt, as many of you already know, because you've stepped on nails too. And now I had a couple other sponsors that were with me, so I, I had them stay with uh, everybody in the youth group and continue on with the project, but I needed to get in the car, and I needed to head... Mm, 10, 12 miles or whatever it was, to uh, this small town that had a hospital and uh, uh, to have it cleaned out and all and get a tetanus shot, you know, jumping through those hoops. And so I went to that hospital, and the guy that was on call when I went to the emergency room, because uh, it was after hours, uh, to have this work done, was the new doctor who uh, not too long earlier had arrived to town. Now, if you didn't grow up in small-town America, then you don't appreciate this. But if you did, you know when a new doctor comes to town in a small community, it's the talk of the town. I mean, it's one of those things everybody becomes aware of. And, and so anyway, this uh, new doctor, he was the one attending to my foot, and so I had my foot elevated, and he was working, cleaning it out and everything, and, and had called the nurse to get a, a tetanus you know, needle and everything all ready. And, and, and so this was my opportunity to get to know him. So I was visiting with him a little bit, and, and he was very professional, very thorough in what he was doing, which I was impressed with. But um, I, I thought, okay, here's an opportunity. I'm going to seize the opportunity. And so I started talking to him, 
And I explained to him that I knew that he was new in town and that my wife and my fairly newborn sons um, and I hadn't been in town that long ourselves. And we hadn't secured a family doctor yet. And so I told him, I said, you know, based on, on what I'm seeing and your thoroughness and all of this kind of stuff, you certainly would have been someone I would have seriously considered, you know, for being a family doctor. But I've got an issue, you know, and just to level with you, I'll share it with you. When, when you came, you came as a partner of an existing doctor that we already had. Here. And this existing doctor had, had been there for decades, and he was well known, not just in that community, but, but in a large portion of downstate Illinois, as being an abortion doctor. You know, he was a doctor that did more abortions than pretty much any down, down st- outside of Chicago um, doctor. And uh, and I told him I said now you know I haven't heard anything about you doing abortions but but you're partnering with him and I've just got some real strong convictions you know because I I believe in life and the sanctity of life and I just cannot in any way you know be a support of that and I said otherwise we probably would have picked you you know to to be our family doctor and he was very courteous he. He wasn't rude with anything that he was saying, um, but he was also very articulate. He, he went on and shared with me that, you know, he did not have any intention of performing any abortions, okay? He, he said, now, I'm capable of doing that and everything, but uh, I, I don't have any intention of doing that. But I also want you to know that I have absolutely no qualms with that. I think at any stage in a pregnancy that abortion um, can be performed. And then he tacked this on to it. He said, and just so you know, I also believe in euthanasia. And I think all you've got to do is take a walk down the hallway of a nursing home and you can see the need for how behind the times our country is, you know, in regards to euthanasia. And, uh, you know, and I was hearing that, and I was just like, okay, well, all right, there's additional reason, you know, why he's not going to be my family doctor. And, and uh, so, but again, very courteous, the whole conversation and all. And, and uh, um, I, I thought, all right, I'm going to use a slightly different angle here. Maybe this will open the door or something. Um, I shared with him that my opposition to abortion and euthanasia, for that matter, um, is on, on, on a moral grounds that I believe God is the giver of life. And we are not to put ourselves in a position where we can make those decisions of who deserves life and who doesn't deserve life. And, and uh, I believe in the sanctity of life. And then that's when he responded by saying to me, and again, he was courteous in the way he said this, so it never got an argument, and there was never, you know, an edginess to it, but, but he said, he said, okay, well, I, I understand what you're saying, because I've talked to others that share similar views, but he said, you know, just for the record, you know, I don't believe in Christianity, I don't believe in any religion, I think they're all man-made, they're not based in truth, They've all been created. It's man's attempt of crowd control. And I said, what do you mean by that? And he said, well, you know, the the government, you know, basically says, and they have law enforcement and all of this in place to enforce this, that you obey the law or else you'll get caught and you'll be in legal trouble. Well, the creation of religion is basically a tack-on way of saying, and if the police don't catch you, God will get you. And so he was saying that that's all, that's all that religion is. It's just something that, that people created, and it's not based in truth. Now, <clears throat> when I was done uh, that night and got the tetanus shot, and it was all bandaged up and all this stuff, and I went limping out to my car, um, you know, just for the record, I wasn't shaken in my faith. 
I wasn't rethinking my views and thinking, thinking that, well, maybe I'm wrong in the way that I'm looking at, you know, because that certainly didn't happen. But, but what was happening that evening and the next couple of days is I kept replaying in my mind, you know, the words that he had said and where those words were coming from. And just so you know, um, today's message, the topic of today's message, this is what is behind why I wanted to include this in the series. Not that we're talking about euthanasia or abortion. We're not talking about those subjects. But, but here, here is the topic today. Is Christianity reasonable? Because basically he was operating from the premise that, of saying that Christianity is not reasonable. It's all man-made. There's no basis in reality or fact or truth regarding Christianity. And so that's what I want to challenge today in what we're going to be talking about. So this, this is our topic. Is Christianity reasonable? And there's multiple angles that we can approach this from, and we're certainly not going to exhaust those various angles, but I want to talk about enough that you've got something to work with when you leave here um, um, in a little bit. The first angle that I want to look at it from is the reliability of the Bible, because usually when people start arguing that Christianity is man-made and you can't believe in it and all this stuff, you know, a first cousin to that kind of thinking is saying that this book is not reliable. You cannot trust the contents of this book. And so the question then becomes, how can we know what is written here in this book is what was written here when it was first written here? You know, I think that's a valid question. And so that's what I want to talk about initially here, um, because critics all the time when they're attacking um, the various views that are found in the Bible, they're attacking the Bible and, and the reliability of the Bible, and, and oftentimes they'll be saying stuff like, well, the Bible hardly resembles the way it originally was written. It has changed so many times over the centuries that it hardly reflects the way that it was originally written. Even though, now, even though there are verses like these in the Bible, 2 Peter chapter 3, or 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 16, that says, The whole Bible was given to us by inspiration from God and is useful to teach us what is true and to make us realize what is wrong in our lives. It straightens us out and it helps us do what is right. Even though there are verses in the Bible that say stuff like that, is that still true? That's the question. Maybe at the time that it was written, some of that, that was mostly true. But is it still true? Because Xerox copiers haven't been around very long. And so the Bible has been copied and recopied and recopied and recopied. And that's the role of scribes, you know, so many times down through the centuries. So how can we know that that's still true? For some of you, when you went to college... One of the assignments, perhaps, that you received was to read and report on the writings of Plato and Aristotle, a couple of pretty big names as far as um, Western civilization is concerned. You know, they uh, are from Greece um, back close to 400 B.C., so we're talking about 24 hundred years ago and their writings have had a huge amount of influence on people and continue to have influence on people to this day but you know no one questions the content of their works whether it be the reliability or the historicity the historical accuracy of of the texts of their writings the Plato and Aristotle writings we have today are simply taken as an accurate rendering of what the authors originally wrote. But did you know, and I'll, I will assume you didn't know this, I didn't know this, but did you know that there are only 12 existing copies 
of their handwritten manuscripts in existence today. Twelve handwritten copies. I'm not saying originals. There's no originals. They didn't survive, but we're talking copies. Twelve handwritten copies of their writings today. And yet, people don't question the content of that at all. So that leads me to ask the question, how many manuscripts do you think there are of the New Testament? I mean, are there 12? I mean, the New Testament takes a lot of heat, a lot of criticism. So how many manuscripts are there? How many copies of the originals? We don't have the originals today. But how many copies do we have? Is it 12? Is it 30? Is it 60? The actual number is 6,400. That's how many manuscripts, complete manuscripts of the New Testament that we have today. Now, if you're going to include fragments as well, which, you know, when you're talking about some of the writing materials that were used, like papyrus, I mean, that can become pretty brittle and, and parchment and all this kind of stuff. And so, so there are definitely fragments in addition. So if, if you look at it from the perspective of not only manuscripts, complete ones, but also fragments, what would that number be then? Over 24,000 of the New Testament. Okay, so it just totally puts to shame, you know, what we have of Plato and Aristotle, which so many people don't even question, but yet they're very quick to question the New Testament. See, we're, this is talking about the whole subject of manuscript evidence, which is an interesting subject to dig into and, and to study. Now, what about the Old Testament? Because the Old Testament is even older. For years, the lack of Hebrew manuscripts was a major target for critics. The oldest Hebrew manuscripts that were in existence for the longest time were what was called the Masoretic Texts. And they date 950, 950 A.D. Now understand that when you're talking about them dating 950 A.D., that the newest part of the Old Testament that was written is the book of Malachi, and Malachi was written in 400 B.C. And so we're basically talking about a gap of 1,350 years from when the last book of the Old Testament was written to where the oldest Hebrew manuscripts, which is the language that they were written in, the oldest of the Hebrew manuscripts is like 1,350 years later. So you can understand why people were, were taking shots at um, the Bible and that the Old Testament is full of legend and these are stories that are unreliable and different scribes kind of added their own little notes and, and kind of um, um, their own imagination took over in, in creating legends and stuff like that as a, as a part of the script. But here's the thing. What some refer to as being the discovery of the 20th century, in 1947, the Dead Sea Scrolls were discovered. The Dead Sea Scrolls were found in a series of caves in the southern part of Israel. A shepherd was looking for a couple of his sheep that had wandered off, and he was throwing at an elevated spot. He was throwing uh, some stones into some caves to see if he could scare out a couple of his sheep, and then he heard the sound of broken pottery. He investigated further and found out that there were clay jars in some of these caves and inside these clay jars were all kinds of scrolls and figuring he could make a few bucks he took some and another guy took some to try to sell them and before you know it all of a sudden some people that were real interested in what these might actually be converged on the site and they ended up finding out that among these scrolls in what has become labeled as the Dead Sea Scrolls, is every book of the Old Testament is represented with the exception of Esther. There's 39 books in the Old Testament. 
38 of those 39 are represented in the Dead Sea Scrolls. Some of them in their entirety, like the book of Isaiah, um, there are multiple copies of Isaiah. Some others, there's just portions of it that survived all of those centuries. But, uh, but, but I- anyway, um, these date back to 150 B.C. Now, remember, the oldest Masoretic text we had was 950 A.D. So basically, we're bridging a gap just like that of a 1,000 years, over a 1,000 years. Now, a lot, uh, this caused a lot of people to sit on the edge of their seats. Some of them excited, some of them scared. What were we going to discover? Were the critics right? Does the Masoretic text hardly read the same as what it used to read? Have there been so many changes and liberties taken by scribes? Or is it going to be just the opposite? And is it going to verify the careful accurateness of the work of scribes? And so there was both excitement and nervousness. And when they started uh, uh, digging into that and making comparisons and all, they ended up finding that uh, these Dead Sea Scrolls were 99.5% the same as the Masoretic text. It was just pretty much right down the line, the same. The half of 1% difference was primarily to do with spelling variations. And so, of course, the people that... that uh, we're saying we have God's word. We're celebrating that for obvious reasons. But one of the things that needs to be understood and better appreciated by people is the work of scribes. You see, scribes, the people that had a responsibility instead of Xerox copiers that hadn't been invented yet, um, the scribes, they viewed what they were copying as being sacred. This was sacred. It was holy. And so they were very careful and meticulous about their work. And there were certain rules that they followed, that they held to. For example, if they had a copy of Scripture, of whatever book, let's say uh, um, Ezra, of the Old Testament, if, if they had the book of Ezra, and that's the scroll of Ezra, and that's what they were copying from, but Ezra was tattered and torn and faded, then what they would do is they would make a copy of that, and then they would destroy the old one. Not because of a lack of respect, but just the opposite, because they viewed God's word as being holy. Holy. And it being tattered and torn and all of this is not the condition that God's word should be in. And that goes a long way in explaining why there were so few Hebrew manuscripts in existence. Because this is the way that uh, um, scribes approach this. Another rule that they had was that no letter could be copied from memory. So let's say they were looking at uh, uh, the text in Ezra, and that's what they were trying to copy over. They wouldn't look at three or four words, Hebrew words, and then write those three or four words over here. That'd be breaking a, a, a cardinal, a very basic rule that scribes had. Instead, they would look at one Hebrew letter, And then they would copy that letter over here. They would look at the next Hebrew letter and they would copy that letter. That's how careful and that's how precise they were. If they made a mistake, either in the way they were writing it or they wrote the wrong letter and then all of a sudden they realized it, they didn't use a magic eraser or something like that to try, they didn't cross it, scribble it out or something. Rather, instead, they took what it is that they were copying on and they destroyed it and they started over with their work. The Masoretes, these were the scribes that... uh, Um, primarily made copies of Scripture um, from the time of Christ leading up to that 950 date that, that, you know, we still have copies of. Um, So so almost the last millennium of the copying of Old Testament Scripture. The Masoretes, they they were even more detail-oriented. They were more, even more careful 
They, they would take like the book of Ezra that we're using as an example, they, they knew exactly how many Hebrew words were in that book. They knew exactly how many Hebrew letters were in that book. And so when they were making, by the time they got done making a copy of Ezra, they were able to then double check by counting the number of words to verify that it was the right number. And if it didn't check out, then they could count it again to double check it. And if it didn't check out, then they destroyed the copy they had just made because they knew exactly how many words. They even knew that on letters. They, they even knew what the center word was of the book of Ezra or any of the Old Testament books. You see, they were very careful and precise about all of this. When you go down this path, talking about the reliability of the Bible, the historical accuracy of the Bible. It's really an interesting study. And part of what you get into with all of this is archaeology. And archaeology can, can, it can, it can, it can um, if you're reading it late at night, it can put you to sleep. I'll let you know that now. But at the same time, it can really be an interesting read. If you're reading you know, a uh, uh, part of it that, that is of particular interest to you. And, and I could spend a lot of time talking about this because the science of archaeology, as far as biblical writings are concerned, I mean, that really kicked into high gear um, around the 18th century and following. It wasn't much of a thing before that, but, but the 18th century and following, it, it really... Uh, became something that they were serious about. Let me just give you two examples. In the 19th century, critics singled out the Hittites as a nation that did not really exist. The Hittites, you spell that H-I-T-T-I-T-E-S, Hittites. The Hittite nation, the Hittite empire, it's referred to a couple of different ways. The thing is that in the Bible, it is referenced in the Old Testament 61 times. So, I mean, there are dozens of references to the Hittites. Outside of the Bible, big fat zero. There wasn't one reference to the Hittites anywhere. And and the whole argument was, there you go. Case in point, something made up because it does not exist outside the Bible. However, in 1906, archaeologists unearthed not only evidence that the Hittite nation existed, but they located the capital city of the Hittite empire and 40 other key cities that made up their empire. And where it was found to exist was in in the area of modern-day Turkey. And uh, I double-checked this um, just to make sure this is true. This was my memory uh, that I was working off of part of this. And and so I I, I Googled it, double-checked it. Um, The University of Chicago, to this day, you can still get a doctorate in Hittite studies from that college. And the irony is 120 years ago, they, like everyone else, probably would have laughed you off, you know, out the door. You know, if you said something about the Hittites, that that just make believe junk. But now it's it's actually a degree that you can get. Here's another example: <clears throat> um, a number of names that are used in the Bible um, are not found or verified in other sources outside of the Bible. One of the names, or at least it had been that way with quite a few names for the longest time, but over the last 150 years, that is really changing. For an example, we recognize clearly, I think everyone in here would recognize this name, Pilate. We all know who Pilate is. Pilate's the one who gave the order to have Jesus crucified. Pontius Pilate. Well, for the longest time, the only place that Pilate was referenced was not only in the Gospels of the Bible, but um, he is referenced in the writing of Josephus, 
who was a first century historian, and one other source, one other historian. And that was it. But there, there were no inscriptions on any kind of artifacts, which is really common to find people's names on artifacts and all um, in, in, in this whole study. But with Pilate, it just didn't happen until, and this was during my lifetime, not when I was paying attention to any of it, but 1961, an Italian archaeologist found a plaque embedded in a step of an amphitheater in a Roman city along the Mediterranean. It specifically refers to Pilate, refers to the office he held, refers to the region he oversaw, Judea, and it specifically refers to the Caesar that was serving at the time as being Tiberius Caesar. Every one of those things consistent with what the Bible had been saying all along. Now, let me just say this. This doesn't prove anything in and of itself, okay? This doesn't all of a sudden prove every single word that's found in the Bibles. We got to accept it as being true. Uh, no, the, uh, the, the power of archaeology, the influence of archaeology, it, it doesn't have that kind of power to do that. But what it does do is it, it verifies the, the historical accuracy, the care that was taken to be accurate with all of these kinds of details in reference to cities and people and nations and coinage and all of that kind of stuff. You'll find example after example being verified in archaeology. Is Christianity reasonable? Well, I mean, that's part of what plays into all of this, but there's more than that. As a matter of fact, the question, is Christianity reasonable? That's not just a modern-day question or quest that has you know, been a part of 20th and 21st century. In fact, even in the Bible, they wanted to establish that the Bible was reasonable. Let me draw your attention to a fellow by the name of Luke. Luke wrote a fair percentage of the New Testament. He only wrote two of the books, but by standards of how long New Testament books are, both of these are pretty long books. He wrote the Gospel of Luke, and he wrote the Book of Acts. Both of them he wrote to a fellow by the name of Theophilus. And if you read the opening verses of the Gospel of Luke, you will see Luke making the comment that I set out for, uh, to do a careful investigation of these things, dear Theophilus, and this is what I came up with. Okay, Now, Luke was a physician by trade. He was a very detail-oriented person. And, uh, you know, and this is just kind of the way he was wired. So he was a good guy to, to uh, be writing uh, different uh, historical accounts like the, the life of Jesus and, and, uh, and then later um, the spread of the church, the history of the first century church. Well, the way it begins in the book of Acts, um, chapter 1, verse 3, that he wrote, he uses these things. Three specific words in pretty much every translation that's represented in this room. You will find those three words found in verse 3 of chapter 1 where Luke says many convincing proofs. And what he is talking specifically about is the resurrection of Jesus. The fact that Jesus is alive and he demonstrated that through many convincing proofs. And then Luke goes on with uh, the rest of the 28 chapters that he ended up writing, and he basically uh, lists out a number of those convincing proofs. So I want to highlight three of those that are found to one degree or another in the book of Acts and also elsewhere in the New Testament. One, an empty tomb. This was something that, that Luke considered to be a convincing proof, and, and for obvious reasons, uh, because it is. 
When Jesus died on the cross, we all know the account that his body was taken down off the cross. And because the Sabbath day was about to start in a kind of a hurried way, they uh, quickly prepared, uh, did a rush job in preparing him uh, for burial. And they placed him in the tomb. And then they put a guard and all of this stuff in front of the tomb. All right, so we know that the biblical account is that the tomb is occupied. However, here's the thing. In Acts chapter 2, Luke is recording Peter's sermon on the day of Pentecost. Now, the sermon is a fairly lengthy sermon, but I want to draw your attention specifically to verse 24 because that has reference to the dead Jesus. And the fact that he's not dead anymore. It says, God released him, referring to Jesus, from the horrors of death and raised him back to life. For death could not keep him in its grip. Now, the thing about this is that Peter wasn't saying this behind closed doors. Peter wasn't whispering this in someone's ears. Peter wasn't writing this down in the shadows, hiding it from the authorities at bay. But rather instead, when you read all the surrounding context, you see that Peter was speaking publicly to a huge crowd of people in which 3,000 of the people, so the crowd was even bigger than that, but 3,000 of the people responded to his message and gave their life to Christ became Christians that day. And this is one of the things that he was saying. He wasn't trying to hide this as a secret belief that he had. He was broadcasting it. And to add to that, what makes this exceptionally um, significant is where Peter was at. He was saying all of this in Jerusalem. Where was it that Jesus was convicted and then crucified and buried? It was either in Jerusalem or right on the edge of Jerusalem. It was only 50 days later. This Acts chapter 2 is the day of Pentecost. It was only seven weeks after the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ. So this would have been something that was fresh on people's minds. Peter wasn't referring to something that happened four score and ten years ago, you know, or in a previous generation. He was talking about something that just happened less than two months earlier. And he's referencing to the fact that Jesus died, but he didn't stay dead because death couldn't keep him in its grips. Now, the Bible tells us that when Jesus died, he was put in the tomb, like I said. Uh, The Bible also tells us that a seal was put on the tomb. And just so you know what the seal was, it wasn't like, uh, um, you know, some kind of a, bondo permanent bond or super glue or something like that it basically was um, some wax on either side of of the stone the opening uh, where the stone was and then a rope that wasn't an overly significant sized rope but a rope that was sealed um, by the wax and it was the message that that sent the message that that sent being that it was a roman seal was you mess with this and the wrath of rome is going to come down hard on you that's what the 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 um uh, the the grave being sealed that's what it meant there were soldiers as i referenced earlier that were stationed at the cross based on the greek terminology that is used regarding the soldiers um, we don't know exactly the number some will claim that they do but but the terminology that's used could mean anywhere from four to sixteen soldiers were stationed and these were roman soldiers at the cross In addition to that, there was a stone that closed the entrance to the tomb. And we don't have to rely upon first century historians to figure out the size of the stone. I mean, because there there are stones on tombs over there now, even ancient stones, that we get a pretty good feel for the way that that whole thing 
um, the way it worked, the groove that was etched into the stone that the stone would roll down into when it would be sitting in place. Anyway, these stones were 2,000 to 4,000 pounds, one to two tons. So not a, not a lightweight or insignificant stone. But yet the whole point being of what he's saying is that Jesus isn't dead, he's alive. And he was saying that just 50 days after the fact. If Jesus' body was still in the tomb, Peter would have been laughed out of town. People would have said, what, are, what have you been smoking? Man, get out of here. Everybody knows he's still in the tomb. No, nobody could argue that fact. It was a well-established fact that Jesus wasn't in the tomb anymore. And so that, that is part of the, the convincing proofs that Luke is referencing. But understand, people didn't come to faith just on the basis of an empty tomb. It was more than that. And that leads me to number two, eyewitness accounts. There were eyewitnesses to the fact that Jesus, though he had died, was now alive. Who exactly? Well, on that first day, according to what we read in the Bible, Mary Magdalene and the other Mary were among the eyewitnesses. Later that same day, two guys on the road to Emmaus. That evening of that first Sunday, 10 of the disciples. Now, obviously, it wasn't Judas Iscariot because he had already taken his own life. And it wasn't Thomas. The scripture says he was out doing something else. But it was the other 10. A week later, you add Thomas to the mix. And then there's this passage. This passage that actually refers to another person or two as well. But the, what especially catches my eye is what it says in 1 Corinthians 15, verse 6, says this. Then he, referring to Jesus, appeared to over 500 brothers at one time. Most of them are still alive, but some have fallen asleep. Now, um, Paul is the one, the Apostle Paul is writing this, and he was writing this a number of years later, okay? But it wasn't like it was generations later. The point that Paul is making is that, okay, it, it's, been, it's been a while, it's been a number of years, but the majority of those 500 people are still alive. Some of them have died in the passage of time. But the majority of them are still alive. And what is being implied there is if you doubt what I'm saying, check it out for yourself. That's what he's telling the people in Corinth. Now, would a lawyer have much to work with if they had 516 witnesses of an event? <laughs> Absolutely. I mean, if a lawyer just had one or two witnesses, they got plenty to work with. But what we're seeing here is that there were many, many more eyewitnesses of Jesus being alive. But in talking about this whole thing about, about convincing proofs, it goes even beyond that. Number three, changed lives. And Luke does illustrate this in what he has to say in the book of Acts, but there are other portions of Scripture as well that highlights this. Changed lives. In fact, it would lead me to say this, and, and this is a rather big thought. Even if all of this stuff about Jesus after his crucifixion and burial, even if Jesus stayed dead, and the rest of the story is being made up, is a part of someone's imagination, has no basis in reality. How would you explain the radical transformation of people's lives? Because there were many people whose lives were totally transformed. Saul of Tarsus, for example. Saul of Tarsus and Luke devotes a good amount of space in his writing in the book of Acts to talking about Saul. He actually spent time traveling with him, you know, after, after the fact, after Saul's conversion. 
Initially, Saul, when he appears in the pages of Scripture, he's a one-man wrecking crew. He's all intent on wiping Christianity off the face of the earth. And he, he wants to have people executed for being Christians. And if that, if that doesn't work, if he doesn't have the authority for that, he'll at least have them imprisoned. But then the Scripture records in Acts his conversion. And after that, he basically, for all intents and purposes, becomes the premier missionary of the first century. What we see is him traveling throughout the known world at that time, and he's starting new churches. He's sharing the gospel, the news about Jesus. What accounts for that transformation in his life? What accounts for the change among the disciples? The disciples on the night Jesus was arrested, you know, the majority of them were so scared, they were, they were so fearful by that, that they scattered this direction and that direction. Only John and Luke kind of followed at a distance, but the rest of them, they hightailed it out of there. But later, just a, a few pages later in the Bible, which is after the resurrection, all of a sudden there is such a boldness among them that they are proclaiming the risen Lord, even in the face of martyrdom which all of them except for one died as martyrs for their faith and for the message that they were delivering what accounts for that kind of a transformation what accounts for for uh, uh, what what would have happened with the 3,000 on the day of Pentecost or what happened with the Philippian jailer and for that matter we don't even need to go back in time we can just kind of look in current days at the reality of the fact that God is still doing the same thing today. He is transforming lives. A number of people in this room are good illustrations of that. Your life before you came to Christ, before you embraced him and professed your faith in him, your life was one thing, but your life now is very different. You've changed. Is that just a result of willpower? Is that just a change that was brought about by determination on your part that you just decided I'm going to be different? That, doesn't, that falls short. That really doesn't describe it. I look in my own life and I look at the changes in my life before Christ and after Christ. And it's hard to explain unless you're looking at the Scripture. And realizing this story really is for real. These are among the convincing proofs that Luke was referencing in Acts chapter 1, verse 13. There's one more thing that I want to touch on today. You know, as we're talking about, as we're talking about is Christianity reasonable, all of these things are valid points to, to spend some time pondering in your mind. Um, but there's one more I've got to, I, I can't skip over. And that is this, the creation of the world. Let me ask you some questions. Did you know that the earth rotates at a speed just over 1,000 miles per hour? That's the orbit of the earth at the equator. Now, maybe you're here and you're thinking, wait, I've been close to the equator and I don't really remember that. Well, yeah, you were part of the rotation. So that's why you didn't, didn't feel that. But all you got to do is Google that. And you, you'll see that that's, that's um, what is popular scientists believe today is that the earth is rotating 1,000 miles per hour. But here's the thing. If it were slowed down by one-tenth, just 10% slower. Life would be destroyed by the searing heat during the day and devastating freezes at night. If it was sped up just a little, catastrophic winds would occur at various times that would destroy everything. I'm not saying, you know, 24 hours a day these winds would be blowing, although there wouldn't be 24 hours in a day if, uh, if the earth had sped up. The day would be shorter then. But, but uh, um, you, you think about the recent hurricane and all the destruction 
down the panhandle of Florida, and you've got images in your mind. You've seen the news. What is it, Mexico Beach, and just how all that was just devastated. What we are told is that if the rotation of the earth was just sped up a little bit, the kind of hurricanes we experience now would be nothing compared to what we would be experiencing. We would be experiencing hurricanes on steroids. I mean, it would be absolutely devastating. You know, dealing with these kind of wind speeds that we're dealing with, that'd be nothing. Did you know that the earth is tilted on its axis at 23.5 degrees? If that wasn't the case, and if the, the earth was straight, food would only grow on a small portion of the earth. Canada and other northern countries and southern countries included would be in a continuous winter. Food wouldn't be able to grow in the United States. 23.5 degrees is the perfect angle for balanced winters and summers. Did you know that the moon orbits the earth right at about 240,000 miles away? <clears throat> This creates the necessary tides with the oceans. If the moon were to move just 20% closer, the continents would be immersed in water twice every day. If you remember the Kevin Costner movie from years ago, Waterworld, yeah, that would be experiencing that a couple of times every day if the moon was just a little closer. Did you know the Earth's atmosphere is only 50 miles thick? If the size of the earth was just a bit smaller, we'd be like mercury, and we would have no atmosphere at all. If we were larger, like Jupiter, the atmosphere would contain free hydrogen, which if you find it hard to breathe from time to time now, you wouldn't be able to breathe then. That's like poison for humans. As it is, the mass of the earth is just right to hold the appropriate atmosphere in place. You know, and you can just keep going down the list of listing one thing after another like that. I mean, it's pretty precise. When you break it down like that, it almost sounds like the earth and all was created this way, designed to be like this. You see, that's what God intended for people to conclude. He has intentionally left his fingerprints all over the place. Let me show you a scripture that was written like 3,000 years ago. Psalm 19, verses 1 to 4, says, The heavens proclaim the glory of God. The skies display his craftsmanship. Day after day they continue to speak. Night after night they make him known. They speak without a sound or word. Their voice is never heard. Yet their message has gone throughout the earth and their words to all the world. This is what the Bible has been saying all along. It's interesting that the Bible doesn't even uh, lay out a defense for God's existence. You, you won't find a passage of Scripture that tries to defend the existence of God. Instead, what you're going to find are verses like uh, Genesis chapter 1, verse 1, says, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. It just assumes God's existence, and it states it as much. Anyone who wants to deny the existence of God has to provide an answer to one supreme question, and that question is, where did the universe come from? If you're going to remove God from the equation, then you've got to come up with an alternative. Where did the universe come from? It all boils down to two alternatives. And you've only got two alternatives. It's either a matter of chance or it's a matter of design. Either everything that we experience in life and we see around us up close in life with as much detail as a, um, um, a hummingbird or whether it's something as immense as the Milky Way galaxy, when, when we're studying this kind of stuff, if you remove God from the equation, you've got to explain all of that either as, as a matter of chance or you've got to bring God into the equation and say, 
that it's all a matter of design. The reality of the matter is both require faith. Both of them require faith to believe. Neither of those can be proven by any scientific method in a, a lab somewhere and saying, well, see, this proves that, you know, stuff can be created out of nothing or something could, you know. No, both of them require faith. The question you got to ask is which is more reasonable? Which is more reasonable? To believe it was all chance or to believe it was all design? Our ushers are going to be getting up and preparing for communion at this time. And, and while they're getting up, I've got one last thing I want to share with you. This, uh, actually, what I want to share with you comes from a book originally. Um, it was first found in a book that was uh, published in 1802. A fellow by the name of William Paley uh, is the guy. And, of course, you know what with, uh, um, you know, all the stuff about some of the evolutionary thought and some of this kind of stuff starting to gain a bit of momentum and all of this. You know, he, he wrote this book and he tried to explain. He tried to, to explain a little sense into the conversation. And so he used what is called the watchmaker argument. And this is where it started in 1802. And basically, the, the, the way this is explained, though I might embellish it just a little bit, um, is that he said, if you were walking along the path or along the road, and let's say you've got a companion with you, and you're walking along, and you stub your toe on a stone that's lying there on the path. And so you take a step back, and you start talking about that stone, and you start off with, well, where'd that come from? How long's that stone been there? You know, what's the story behind that stone? Well, some of the answers that you may end up coming up with, well, that stone has always been there. That stone has always existed. Oh, it might have existed over there, but now somehow it got knocked over here. But this stone has been around forever. Okay? Those might be some of the explanations that are attempted to be given. However, if you were walking along the path with a companion and all of a sudden kicked something with your foot and took a step back to see what it was and then reached down to pick it up and you saw this, which I'll use the kind of watch they would have used back in William Paley's day, a pocket watch, and you would have taken a closer look at the pocket watch you would see a number of things. You would see a hinge. You would see metal. You would see glass. You would see, um, if you took the back off, you would see some gears and some springs and, and things like that. So what would you conclude based on what it is that you and your friend were looking at? Would you say, huh, isn't that interesting? You know, I think what ended up happening is someone was eating some dill pickles and they threw the mason jar out, out of the, the wagon they were riding in and it shattered and a piece of glass landed right here in the ditch. And then at a later time, someone, someone was riding their horse by finishing off a can of beer and they threw their beer can in the ditch and it landed right by that piece of glass and then at another time, there were a couple kids that were running because they were late to school, and the papers flew out of the bag of one of them, and it had a couple paper clips attached to it, and that landed here. And then over a period of time of decades and perhaps even centuries, there was some, some freezing and thawing and, and rain and water erosion and, and all of this, and eventually all of that stuff kind of kind of melded together and created this as a result. And that's his whole argument that he's making, William Paley. He's saying, how reasonable does that sound? Because the universe that we live in is a thousand times more complex than a watch. 
And so to try to argue that all of this just kind of came around by happenstance, uh, just by chance, he says, you're really reaching. All of this is an indication and is evidence that we have a designer. And he's making a valid point. I mean, he was a guy from 200 years ago. But I guess people were pretty smart even 200 years ago, right? Yeah, let's close with prayer. Father, I'm thankful for your word and for the opportunity we have to talk about things that do have an impact on our lives today. We seem to be spoon-fed with so many different philosophies and beliefs and even chastise if we question what is the current acceptable um, assumptions that are being promoted. And, and Father, yet today when we've taken a little bit of time, spent our time thinking it through, we begin to realize that uh, a lot of the stuff that's being forced upon us doesn't really make a whole lot of sense. Father, I thank you for the fact that you are a God that has left your fingerprints on the world around us so that we can have reminders built in if we're paying attention to the fact that indeed all of this didn't come about by chance, but you created it. Thank you for the fact that your word was so carefully protected over all this time and transmitted and recopied and down, down through the centuries. So today what we read, can, we can have confidence in knowing that this is what was written so long ago. Father, we love you, and we celebrate the good news of Jesus Christ because that's at the very heart of the message of your word. And while we take the bread and we eat it here in a moment and the cup and we drink it, we're reminded of the body and the blood of Jesus and we're reminded of your love and, and the way you provided what we needed most so that we could be freed, saved, set free from our sin. Lord, we celebrate today the life we have in Christ. Help us not to take it for granted. Instead, help us to take it, the news of this life, and not keep it to ourselves, but to share it with others who need it just as bad as we needed it in days gone by. We thank you for your love. It's in Christ's name I pray. Amen.